Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening to Art Blog Radio. I'm Roberta Fallon. I'm your host today. And today I'm very excited to be talking with Jody Throckmorton, Curator of Contemporary Art at Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, and Brittany Webb, uh, Curator Dr. Brittany Webb, Evelyn and Will Kaplan, Curator of 20th Century Art and the John Roden Collection. So welcome both of you ladies. I'm very eager to hear about your new show. So we're here to talk about Taking Space, which opens November 19th at PAFA. We're going to call Pennsylvania Academy PAFA. It's kind of nickname because it's quicker. Um, the full title of the show is Taking Space, colon, Contemporary Women Artists and the Politics of Scale. And it presents art from the museum's permanent collection. And it's a very large show. There's 52 names. I don't know how many pieces of art by these uh, women, but it's a very, very large show in the Fisher Brooks Gallery, which is a very large space to fill. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing this when it opens. And it's about, well, it has the word politics in the title and scale and women. And I wanna get into all those three things because I think they're very important. Uh, have always been, and it's really good to talk about women in the context of politics and space. So the show was co-curated by Jody and Brittany, and the works deal with the female body, size, scale, repetition, and these are, the curators are arguing, signifiers of politics. Um, so I want to hear first about your curation. Curating, generally speaking, I think is a singular event in a person's life. Um, there aren't a lot of co-curated shows. So what was it like to co-curate and why did you do this as a co-curation? And well, I don't know yeah. who wants to start out here and I don't have any preference. I, I can start if that's okay. And then, and it's kind of funny because we haven't talked, I mean, there's been a few texts back and forth where we've talked about <laughs> what it's like to work together, but uh -huh. I think this is the first time. So we may did completely disagree with each other. I don't know, <laughs> but um, for, That'd be for great. me, it's been, it's for me, it's been amazing. I mean, it's kind of, um, I think the, the worst nightmare of working together is that it won't work. You won't be able to work together. And that at least for me has not been the case. I think that we, we each have strengths that we bring and they're different. Some are the same strengths and some are different, you know, different time periods, different types of artists. And that has been really helpful. And I will push back just a tiny bit on the, on the collaborative question about curatorial work being singular or whatever. Um, and that's certainly, I've done a lot of that at PAFA, but there's, there's a lot that happens between the three curators at PAFA that's, that's, I think more collaborative than other institutions, hmm. you know, cause we're, we're really interested in, in smushing time periods together, I guess, <laughs> to say. So, you know, Dr. Anna Marley is our historic um, American art curator. And so it's not uncommon at PAFA for, you know, things from the 19th century to be paired with things from the 20th century and the 21st century. Hmm. Um, so that's been, that's been, really wonderful to do that at the institution. And then I think that same spirit has really carried through in our partnership, Brittany. Yeah, I think um, I'm echoing um, Jody's sentiments that we always sort of feel like this work is a team sport, um, even when <laughs> everyone doesn't get credit for their contributions. So what's been nice about our collaboration with this exhibition, I think is, um, some of the conversations we've had where we've talked about how and where works fit um, or why something doesn't really fit. There were several iterations of the checklist where we sort of kicked ideas around back and forth. And it's sort of nice to um, have some so many of these processes be outside of one's own head. Um, <laughs> It's nice to have the, you know, the multiple perspectives, the different ways of seeing a thing. Um, Jody has been at PAFA longer than I have. So even thinking about, you know, other histories that we aren't aware of in terms of the objects history with the institution or thinking about other places where we've seen artists, these artists discussed, I think that there's just been more 
um, sort of more information, more conversation than there would be if it was just one person. And I feel like that's really enriched the project. In addition to the fact that, you know, you have two sets of eyes, you have two sets of hands, There, there's some work that we actually can kind of divide and conquer in a way that's really productive. That's true well, too, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, talking about the different time periods, Jody, the way you mentioned, sometimes you have things from the 21st century along with the 19th century together. It seems to me in this show, you have mixed up 20th and 21st century. So there's everything from the Gorilla Girls who, well, they started in the 60s, I believe, and Barbara Kruger and, you know, Anna Mendieta, who was even in the 50s, maybe, correct me if I'm wrong. And then we have Emily Brown, contemporary artist working today, and, um, you know, Deborah Willis and Michalina Thomas. And so it's all mixed in. It makes it very meaty that you throw things together from different time periods and don't just have it so narrow that you sort of cut off your nose to spite your face, you know? I hope so. I hope that's how people feel. Um, and we could have gone, we could have even, you know, originally when the show started, we were back in abstract expressionism mm. uh, cause there are some great examples and a few did end up in the show actually. Um, you know, we have a great Lee Krasner for example, um, in the show, Nora Jaffe. Um, but we ended up kind of moving that date a little forward because mm -hmm. there was so much that we wanted to include. And believe it or not, the show's actually expanded beyond Fisher Brooks as well. Oh, it's wow. now in the, it's now upstairs in our beautiful Tuttleman sculpture gallery with the, mm -hmm. with the wonderful windows. And it's also in the, um, in the school of fine arts gallery around the stairs. So we've, we've, we've taken up more space, I guess. <laughs> at Papa too, which is really great. Um, so yeah, let's talk about that term because as I was thinking about it, it used to be we would say in a negative way, you're just taking up space. And now I, I want to say the term has a different connotation, which is positive. Taking space is like seizing space, right? So talk about that. And I'm sure that you proactively chose that term for the show. And Brittany, do you want to take this one? Because really the core work is this Deb Willis work that yeah. I think sets off that term quite well. Yeah. Yeah, I do think we were really intentional about like this. Thank you for the word seizing. Um, there's a there's a way that um, in conversations around what we called the show, um, we talked about imagery of this kind of taking the claiming um, for a while. I think we were thinking about scale both as uh, noun and a verb, sort of like this idea mm -hmm. of women scaling some mm -hmm. of these um, these giant mountains, whether that's the mountain of art history, um, trying to master a particular kind of technique um, or material. Um, but also there's a there's this really lovely uh, Deb Willis, image that is the core of the show that's a lithograph that I can actually pull up for us because I think it's just really lovely to think with. Um, and it it features this work um, that is called I Made Space for a Good Man. But the, the way that that work um, is sort of set up, you know, you have this, this serial images, this, these three self, um, these three self-portraits of Deb Willis as a young pregnant artist. And it's framed by these words, a woman taking space from a good man. Um, this quote, you took the space from a good man. And the final image, I made a space for a good man. And it it's drawn from her experiences as an art student in Philadelphia, being told by a male professor, um, you know, that it was a shame that she was in his class, that she was just taking up space that could have gone to a good male artist. This idea that because she was a woman, she was going to get married, she was going to have children, that was going to preclude her from having a kind of arts career. And even just that kind of thinking, that sort of fantasy of a future that hadn't even arrived yet was enough that this professor decided that she didn't even deserve a space in the classroom or a space in an art program. And 
And even thinking about both the physicality of that and the sort of the idea of denying a young woman even the dream space, like the idea to, to have the space of her mind to imagine a particular mm -hmm. kind of future, really kind of that sat with us in a way that, that it's a, sort of a, a touchstone or an anchor to think about all of the ways that women artists in terms of medium, in terms of demanding space in a classroom or in a program or in a studio or in a conversation um, is, is a great sort of rallying cry for this exhibition to think about how, you know, it's very political to, to hold that story and to have a kind of career and to reclaim that in, in her artwork. Um, and she also, you know, in this image, she's She's reclining and she's pregnant with Hank Willis Thomas, who also went on to become a celebrated American artist. So there's there's a lot that's there's so rich about this work and that's rich in the show. So to think about what it is to take up space, um, the fact that 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 in some cases does have a negative connotation, but there are a lot of ways that I think the artists in this exhibition have really flipped that um, and claimed a lot of space and taken up a lot of space in a way that is intellectually productive and also visually stunning. Yeah, and, and, and I mean, where would we be if Deb Willis took that as a, you know, this she got this comment, negative comment done instead of a charge really like, okay, well now I'm, you know, where would we be in art history without her scholarship? I think about all the art, the, all the photograph, all the photographs that we'd be missing out on. And, um, you know, we'd be in a very different place I think without Deb Willis. So uh, thankfully she did take it as a charge. And I think that's something that unites the artists in the show. Mm -hmm. It's that charge to, to claim space. Yeah, so let's talk more about the show and who's in the show, because it seems to me that there are artists like Deb Willis who overtly take space and use the concept of empowered space for women. Um, obviously, Grill Girls, Micheline Thomas, Betty Saar. Um, and then there are those who are pivoting to your point of scale, you know, the scale shifts that um, might include taking space, such as Emily Brown, who I mentioned before, who tends to work very large. She's making landscape uh, paintings and very large, very beautiful. And Vizia Kelmans, who works tiny, really small, very microscopically. Uh, Mia Rosenthal also works on the you know microscopic level. So those are making statements of scale. So talk about that a bit, because I thought that was very interesting to open it up to a discussion of politics and scale. Yeah, yeah. And and the Emily Brown one is an interesting one, because believe it or not, we didn't choose one of the bigger Emily Brown works, <laughs> which is we, we chose a beautiful, I think, I shouldn't say that, but I think we chose a really beautiful piece by Emily that as far as I know, it hasn't been up since since I've been there, but um, it's a it's a shadow image of her, which is a portrait. Um, mm. So some of those. So in the case of Emily, it was it was more about um, sort of taking space, putting yourself in that in that artwork, and taking space in that way. Um, but I think that the you know Mia's Mia's work in the show is is all about the Hadron Collider. So it was it was uh, the, it was a piece that we had up in the Morris Gallery. I don't know some five or six years ago at this point, um, but. I think there's a there's a buildup in gesture that happens or buildup in mark making is better a way to think about it, I think, in both Mia's work and Via Salman's work that that I think, I don't know, gets you to a different, it gets you to a more expansive, even if it's more conceptual um, place that's not about sort of physical size of the parameters of the piece, but more more of that kind of build up, almost an obsessive kind of mark making thing. Um, so I think we, we wanted to make the point that that um, I think scale can mean a lot of different things. I mean, I th we have scale as a dimensional quality, of course, uh, but there's something about scale, conceptual scale even maybe is the way to think of it or um, yeah, that expansiveness as well. But, but I think that, that you're right in catching on that um, some of, there's a, there's, a, there's a variety in what politics means to these artists 
And to me, that's one of the really great qualities of the show. Um, something that I had to learn very early on in my work with 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 um, women artists is thinking about um, how we all uh, and a lot of the artists have very complex and different views on feminism. And uh, so, so I mean, Joan Brown is someone, for example, who we have an incredible self-portrait by her in the exhibition that is essentially a, uh, a, a parody of what people think a female artist is. So it shows Joan Brown in like a 1950s cocktail dress in high heels, painting a dainty still life of a flower in gloves, you know? And then you look on the floor and there's just paint everywhere. <laughs> so that's the clue of, of, this is how Joan Brown really worked on <laughs> the bottom here. Um, but then, oh good, yes. And then, um, then we've got this parody of a female <laughs> artist, but you know, Whereas I look at this work and I think how incredibly feminist it is from my perspective, Joan was of a generation and of a time um, and, and her own personal choice was to, was to sort of more uh, act as a feminist rather than be sort of political about it. So I, I think we did make some, you know, not, I would say, I don't know, I mean, we didn't talk to every artist and ask them, are you a feminist? Uh, <laughs> but I think there's a, there's a variance in, in that approach and, and their relationship to it. And I hope that that actually makes people realize how even complicated the idea is that we have a show of only women artists. Like, what does that even mean? Um, you know, Brittany talks a lot about the Helen Molesworth quote, which I don't know if we have, so I'm sorry for putting you on the spot about this, Brittany, but, but about what it means to be a feminist curator or to, to lay out a show in a feminist way. So you know, what are, what's the relevance of having a, a group show of only women? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Like, I think, I think, I don't, and Brittany, I don't know. I feel like we're, we're kind of open to that consideration and, cri and criticism too. Um, Cause we talked a lot about what that meant uh, about it being a, a female only show and, and orient, orient, orienting that in that way. Yeah, and I think one of the things that makes this really interesting is um, where I think Jody and I both self-identify as feminists. And so we have taken feminist readings of works in ways that it's possible the artist didn't necessarily intend. Um, but we also are being really expansive about what we imagine feminism looks like in museum practice. And so to, I think about the many iterations of the show that there were earlier versions of the show where at first we were thinking we were just taking large scale work, only the biggest, most ambitious pieces. And then we thought about the politics of, um, you know, maker space and, and studio space and who that would leave out if we if we think about the fact that, you know, studio space is part of an artist practice that is linked to a political economy that does not always benefit women. So what does it look like to decide that women who have made work that is ambitious in other ways, um, that isn't necessarily about making the largest possible painting, um, who does it leave out? People who don't have access for economic reasons um, or geographic reasons to the space that allows them to make large scale work or the space that allows them um, or the money that it that uh, that um, you need to to afford those kinds of materials. Um, and so to think expansively about politics, like the politics of political economy, the politics of arts education, um, if we're if we're if we're sort of taking our cues from artists who are thinking about those things in their work, even if it's not in artist statements or even if it's not um, signaled in the title of the work, um, there are interviews where people talk about this and they talk, they talk about the ways that they've navigated through this. Um, the idea that making work about domesticity is, is not necessarily a small thing, that that can be read as, as a large ambitious practice. Um, what what are what are our sort of feminist impulses around apprehending that work as just as important or just as interesting or just as intellectually rich as some as as other kinds of works that have been read differently um, in arts and institutional spaces? Um, and so this Helen Molesworth essay, "How to Install Art as a Feminist," is something that we've been thinking with. You know, this question of what does it mean to take women's absence in museums as the very historical condition Condition under which the work of women artists is both produced and understood. Um, 
And we are also thinking about the, the ways that that work has been produced and misunderstood and what opportunities um, we have in this, in this exhibition that's thinking about the politics of space, the politics of scale, the politics of making, um, the politics of what it looks like to, to produce ambitious work as an artist, um, what we could do with that in an institution. Um, and I also want to sort of signal the fact that this is a permanent collection show. We're also thinking about the politics of institutional history building. What does it look like to have this be a show where we are committed to showing works that are that we have a responsibility to steward the care and the long-term sort of health, both physically and intellectually, um, to not do a show where we've invited a ton of loans or a lot of temporary works that will be in, in our galleries on view temporarily and then sort of get dispersed um, and in some cases lost to history. You know, there is a history of that in art history. What's our responsibility as curators um, to sort of push against that tide to make it possible for, you know, 50 years from now for, for people to be thinking with very different kinds of artworks and very different kinds of historical legacies, what can we do to sort of push against that right now? I really like what you said, and it makes me think the show has a universality to it also in its largeness that goes really well with our time right now of inclusivity, the need for inclusivity and pointing to the future so a show that points in a direction like this is uh, an example, you know? That's lovely. I love that. I love to think that could, that could happen. Yeah, I think it could. You guys got to seize, seize the space and take it, move it there that way. There you go. You're right. <laughs> um, so do you want to say anything more about the show? What else are you excited about in the show before I get to a couple of questions about PAFA in general? Yeah, I, I mean, not to not to belabor the, the permanent collection point, but that's <laughs> something that I think we feel super, super proud of. Um, because most, I cannot remember, 85%, Brittany, is that right? 85% of the work in the show was collected over the last five to six years. Yeah. So, so I hope, I don't know that that's what people will walk away from knowing um, that, that we're, we're committed to this, uh, you know, and um, it's important to us that, that they're not one-off shows, that, that um, women artists have a legacy at PAFA, and um, we're really proud of that. How about you, Brittany? Anything to add about the show in particular that you love and are so proud of and I mean I think I really I, I love how expansive it is I love the you know it's visually stunning um I will say that in this roller coaster of a year that we're having um even installing this show has been a bit of a bright spot I think it's been <laughs> you know there are a million ways 2020 has been a very difficult year in the world um, in this country, in the city of Philadelphia, and in our sector, and thinking about just what it feels like to stand in the galleries looking at work as it's being solved. Um, I, I, I think we have been feeling the ways our eyes have been a little bit starved for, for looking at work by artists this year, engaging artists this year. Um, I you know, there's this gorgeous um, metal sculpture by Allison Schatz that's being installed in Tunnelman Gallery that is uh, just a just a stunning piece to think with, you know, what it is to make sculpture out of a heavy material like metal, but suspended from the ceiling in a way that is it's it's meant to be sort of light and reflective visually. Um, like that duality is really fascinating to to think with. That if you think of large scale installation metal sculpture, um, you know, when somebody calls that up for me, I think Richard Serra. Um, and so to to see an artist take on large scale metal sculpture and to make it so light that it, it lifts off the floor, that it reflects the light in the room, across the room is sort of shimmering and it's almost soft, you know, this, you almost, you like wanna touch it or push against it. It, it doesn't feel like, like a monument in the way that we think of large scale sculptural monuments. It feels like something you wanna engage with, you almost wanna move with it. And that kind of, you know, even just getting to take that in visually to sort of stand in front of it, like, Wow. I mean, there's a, there's a kind of breath 
of fresh air that we need in 2020. And I also think that there, there are things that that does for us in thinking about ways that artists are always reimagining our approaches to how we're thinking about the material physical conditions that we live in. And we absolutely need to be doing that kind of thinking in 2020 to be sort of forward facing future thinking. Um, there's, there's a way that that kind of becomes, I don't know, sort of philosophically exciting. What does it feel like to sit with artists and think about all the ways that we can reimagine the material, physical conditions of our lives right now? Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah. Um, are you guys, this is for both of you, are you optimistic about the future of museums in general? We're in a really hard space right now where museums are having to rethink their budgets because of recession, um, management of the collection, how to interact with the community. It's, it's hard. So are you optimistic? What do you think? I mean, uh, yes, I'm optimistic, <laughs> but there's a lot of work to do, you know? Um, in some ways, I think that what's happening has only brought it out in, in full view in mm -hmm. a way. Like, I think that there's a lot of us that um, maybe we're trying to do work in our small way the best we can. I mean, it can it could always be better and we could always improve, certainly, um, and and listen more. But I think the, the, the really great thing that's happened, frankly, that, that maybe makes me more optimistic is that I think it's also hit a different level of awareness. Mm -hmm. um, and that's at the board level. That's also at the, at the press level where people are paying more attention to what museums are doing. So, you know, in, in, in dark, and th these kind of, when I go down a hole, because there were moments <laughs> this summer definitely where I was feeling less optimistic. Um, you know, I try to say that, that maybe it means that people are paying more attention to museums, you know? Um, I'm hoping that means that people still see value and, and want museums to pull through. Uh, but there's a lot of hard work to do uh, at every single level of, of most organizations, I think, uh, to, make some, to make some big changes. And, and I think, you know, in the 21st century, a lot of that is, and make, make big changes fast. Fast, which is harder yeah. to do. <laughs> I don't know what you think, Brittany. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I think the fact that there are, um, we're having sort of it larger conversations and by larger, I mean, there are more people participating in the conversations. Mm -hmm. They're happening in more spaces. Um, the space of the press, the space of museums themselves. Um, people are talking about these things uh, on social media. I think that this is a reflection of you know, a, 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 a push that's been happening for a long time. And so there's a kind of optimism to the fact that no one is really in a position to pretend this conversation isn't happening anymore, which maybe <laughs> wasn't the case 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, I also think that there are more, you know, when we say institutions have a lot of work to do, um, I'm always thinking, you know, we are institutions. If you are a member of a museum, you are part of that institution. If you work in a museum, you are part of that institution. Um, that means that we all have a lot of work to do, but thank God there are so many of us who actually want to do it and are willing to do it. Um, and there are so many things that you can do as a member or a visitor, as a staff member, mm. as a constituent. Um, as an arts lover, um, to take on that work of an institution, not just sort of pushing against it, um, but if you imagine yourself to be in collaboration with an institution or in collaboration with a community, um, there are a ton of things you can do. And so we're, you know, we're also lucky, I think, in this exhibition to have, um, you know, a little less than half of the works that are in the permanent collection on view in Taking Space uh, were gifts to the collection. And I don't think that I don't think that people think about the politics of that, um, but there is something that you can have powerful, we, I think, are exhibiting that folks have had powerful impact on what's possible for an institutional collection and what's possible for an exhibition by gifting work um, that maybe an institution wouldn't have otherwise been interested in. Um, and that also, I think, sort of speaks to this moment of recession, sort of what does it look like to think about the future of collections if you have small budgets? And I think that there's a way that um, you know, we're, we're lucky to be in community with so many passionate 
art lovers, art collectors, um, stewards of art in their own sort of communities and lives um, that have, have worked with us in this way that benefits, I think, everyone. Um, that that's one small way that I think, um, you know, individuals can have major impact on what the future of museum work can look like. Yeah, and I mean, when you think about the, you know, uh, Linda Lee Alter's gift. She mm -hmm. gave her, her, her collection is all art by women. She gifted that to Pap. If you think about the Sorgenti family and um, the collection of work by African-American artists that they gave to Papa. This was, excuse me for not knowing exact time period, but 10, 15 years ago. And that set the path for frankly, the work that we're doing. So uh, those, those gifts and, and subsequent gifts too. And frankly, things as well that, um, now big museums are really excited to have, but at the time when, when these things were gifted, I think PAFA was adventurous in saying, yes, uh, we do want this work um, that no one else was looking at, that now, you know, we're, we're so fortunate to have. And, you know, as a museum and an art school, I think we're always thinking about students mm -hmm. and, and students as people who, um, as arts makers and as future arts historians, um, will be the next phase of what this field looks like. Um, all that work feels really important. So it means that our, our young artists, our young makers and scholars are getting to study this work um, in the collection, on view in exhibitions, thinking with faculty and thinking with curators about what's important that that, um, you know, if I can go back to to what uh, we love about that Deb Willis lithograph, what would it have looked like um, for her if her experience of art school had been with this kind of collection, with these kinds of shows, mm -hmm. um, and with these kinds of you know, young feminist curators um, who were sort of pushing this work as the kind of work we want to see in the field, um, the field might look differently. And I mean, I thank God that she wasn't pushed out of it, um, but we also want to be part of creating a world where no one is being pushed out mm -hmm. of, of the field at these sort of early points. And, and this is one way we think we can, we can sort of push at that. This is a conversation I would like to extend for another hour and a half, but I think we can't do that. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Brittany Webb and Jody Throckmorton for talking with me. This has been an art blog radio delight. And thanks Thank everybody you. for listening and we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.